Take a seat. It is brilliant to see you. And uh, a few more have arrived since we started. And what I would love to do, in the spirit that Tom has uh, shared in terms of not wanting to gloss over anything, I just want to honor Duncan and Lucy this morning doing the candle procession. There was a beautiful moment where they'd lit both candles, and then Lucy tried desperately to try and blow out the, uh, the taper. And she tried, and she tried, and she tried. And then she went, I'm wearing my mask. <laughs> And she removed the mask, and, and she managed to blow it out, and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's great. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Alan. I'm the Baptist minister here, and uh, together with Tom, we muddled through. And uh, Anyway, let's move on. Um, so it's a real joy. Uh, we are going to be looking through the Advent season uh, at uh, Joy to the World, Joy to the World. And um, today, where I'm going to be landing this is to start off with uh, something from the Psalms which says this, weeping may stay for the night but joy comes in the morning. That no matter what we're going through, that there is a light that dawns in the darkness, that God is good. And we're going to look at some tough stuff today. I'm not going to pretend that this is going to be light, um, but uh, stay with us. Hopefully, this will be something of looking at uh, shoring up our faith, dealing with the stuff of life in real life, and uh, hopefully we'll be strengthened, and who knows, there may even be some breakthroughs as we go through this morning. Um, A storm passed through. I don't know whether you were were expecting a storm to pass through. Uh, I woke up uh, and went to the toilet about 6 o'clock yesterday morning and thought, the world's gone white. What's happening? This wasn't forecast, surely. And uh, what's more, I didn't spot it at the time, but later on uh, in the morning as as we got up, uh, Helen spotted that our beautiful, beautiful willow tree in the back garden, one of the major branches had uh, been torn off in the storm. And so about a third of our beautiful willow is now lying in our garden. And uh, I think that as we journey through this morning, I think that there is that sense that as we go through the storms of life, that there are times and moments where we have to deal with the aftermath of, uh, of what's gone on. And hopefully as we journey through together that we will see um, something uh, in the way that God has for us to deal with some of that stuff. So today's reading is from Matthew chapter 1 uh, verses 18 to 25. And it should appear on the screen behind me. There we go. Here we go. So let's dive in. It says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together... She was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son and gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. I wonder as Joseph was growing up, I wonder as he was learning his trade as a carpenter, I wonder if he ever sort of looked forward and imagined what his life might be like. I wonder what Joseph's dreams were as a little boy. I bet it wasn't this. He was a devout Jew. He was an adherent to the law. He lived in a religious society, and he's betrothed to Mary, beautiful young girl. And all of a sudden, Mary disappears. 
we hear whispers and rumors that, he, that she's gone and she's staying with a relative elsewhere. And then she returns some months later, heavily pregnant. Now, Joseph is a righteous man, so he has in mind to divorce her quietly. But even to contemplate divorce in that time, for a man, hmm, maybe it'll be okay. But for a young woman, ruin, disgrace. He gets a visit in a dream from an angel. Maybe he was eating too much cheese. Who says... The child is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Take her as your wife. It's a big deal. And if that were not enough, shortly later, they have a little trip to Bethlehem where she gives birth in less than sanitary conditions. And if that weren't enough, there's a murderous king on the loose who wants to take the life of that new child, probably yours too. And so you end up fleeing down into Egypt where you become a refugee, an exile. Joseph is hardly living his best life. And I wonder, I wonder for you sat here, I wonder if you are young, I wonder what your dreams are as you look forward to the future that lies ahead of you. If you are uh, my age, maybe you're looking back and thinking, well, I... What lies ahead? And if you are looking back on your life, I wonder the dreams that you had for your life and whether you are living those dreams or something else. Uh, For me, uh, I used to swim, swam to a reasonably high level. Maybe, just maybe, I would have made it to the Olympics. Maybe I would have medaled. Maybe I would have got the gold. Maybe I would have been a world record holder. Maybe the pinnacle of my career would have been the invite onto Strictly Come Dancing. Imagine, imagine. My wife has just died at the front. It's all right, they have professionals, they teach you how to dance, darling, it's all good. But what could it have been? Maybe I would have been a CBBC presenter, another route onto Strictly. I don't know. I don't know, but maybe I could have worn sequins in public and my wife would have enjoyed it and clapped along. Who knows? Recently, uh, I was uh, on a um, Zoom call, a little mini conference for Baptist leaders uh, in Yorkshire. And uh, Jeff Lucas, uh, writer, broadcaster, um, he pointed to a book that he'd read recently by a guy called Viv Thomas, which is called Second Choice, Embracing Life as It Is. And in that book, uh, he says that in life, we rarely get our first choice. We don't get to live in our dream world. Instead, we often end up living our second choice. Or I would like to go a little bit further, or our third choice, or our fourth or fifth or 20th choice, or even that life that never even made it onto the list of options that we thought that we might be living. So in the storms of life, In the aftermath, how do we embrace a life that doesn't turn out quite the way that we were expecting? So for me, after a Christmas swim meet here in Sheffield, we were out celebrating. I may have had one or two too many shandies. I was down in the Leadmill nightclub and uh, I uh, fell over um, from quite a height. There's a story behind that, which I'm not going to go into now. But I ended up damaging uh, my right shoulder. And although I had physio and other things, it never, I never quite got back to the levels uh, that, uh, that I had once got to. And so I ended up stopping swimming. That was a big knock. Uh, relationship breakdowns, not with my wife, uh, but which also involved my best friend at the time. Uh, I scraped through exams. I was drinking far too much. And then later in that summer... Uh, and one does look back and question their life choices. I found myself in America selling aerial photographs door to door. (laughs) What, Lord? What was that about? Anyway, I was supposed to be out out for the whole long summer, 11 weeks uh, selling aerial photographs uh, around the sort of Milwaukee area, beautiful sunshine. 
Uh, and then on about uh, day 11 of this 11-week jaunt selling aerial photographs, um, I, I encountered a dog who I later discovered uh, his name was Rusty, uh, a golden retriever, who appeared really friendly until I got a little bit close and Rusty the dog relieved me of the end of my nose uh, and bit it clean, up, clean off. Um, I don't need to uh, talk about blood and gristle and oh, all kinds of stuff, but I'd given him something to chew on, so uh, all was, was well. And since then, I've had lots of not my first choice things that have happened. And I am, I guess, a middle-aged man. I'm just going to embrace it here this morning. Let's say, uh, thanks, Tom. That's a pleasure. You're only a couple of years younger than me, sir. Um, uh, but we had the privilege this Wednesday of opening up the building again uh, for Natta. Uh, it was their first sort of full running. Previously, they'd come in and they'd had a, uh, a pilot, but, but in they came. And uh, there was, um, pre-COVID, there was a lovely couple uh, who I had a real soft spot, soft spot for. And uh, the husband was struggling a little bit with dementia. Um, and the wife was here on Wednesday. And so I got chatting with her. Oh, how are you? How's your husband? And over the course of the COVID pandemic, um, she has uh, seen her husband um, really go downhill with regards to dementia. And she has had the dubious pleasure of putting him into a home that is local. She visits two, three times a week. And she's not even sure if he knows who she is. I don't think it's their first choice life. I can't even imagine what that would be like. And surely in moments like this, we ask the question, surely God, it's not supposed to be like this. Really? Really, God? Is this what life is all about? Because we live in a world, don't we, surrounded by advertising, which sells us our first choice life. You've been through the pandemic. Last Christmas was pretty awful. So we're going to make the most of it this year. It's going to be a Christmas to remember, apart from that pesky new variant. So things are maybe not quite going to be as they might be. But it tells us that we deserve something more, doesn't it? Social media allows us to look at everybody else's first choice, highly edited lives. And we think, why do they get to live their best life and not me? What's going on? Come on. And then there are also those times, those moments when we come into church and we are having a tough time. And we look around and we see all the perfect Christians singing their happy songs. And we think, am I allowed to do disappointment? I'm not sure I am. And we think, I'm not sure this is for me anymore. And if you've ever wandered into church, and if you've ever had that experience, I want to say from the front, I'm really sorry if there's stuff that we've done where you felt that it's not okay to be not okay. Because this is a place where real life happens. So what do we do when we don't get to live our first choice life like Joseph? Bride's reputation is in tatters. It's business may well dry up overnight as the highly religious society judges him and her, fleeing the tyrant king, becoming a refugee. He's done nothing to deserve this. How can James in the Bible write, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds? Ugh. How can figures in the Bible keep on worshipping God when everything seems to be going so wrong? We've been looking at Nehemiah in the mornings. A nation has just been sacked, taken over, destroyed by a conquering army. Jerusalem, their great city, has fallen. Huge numbers of their, uh, of their countrymen have been put to the sword. They're carried off into a land and to a culture that they don't know and they don't understand. And yet we still find them worshipping. 
What, Lord, is going on? And you probably know some folk in your own lives and in this church that have lived and journeyed through some horrendous stuff, and yet they still come and they still worship. How do they do it? And when the bad stuff happens to us and when the, those that we love go through tough times, surely at some stage in our lives we have to wrestle with the big questions. Did God make the dog bite my nose off? Is that you, God? It's not very nice, is it? Oh God, maybe it wasn't you. Maybe you just sat back and let it happen. It's not very nice either, is it? Was I not praying hard enough? Was I not praying in the right way? Maybe I didn't lift my hands. Maybe I should have spoken in tongues. Is it me, Lord? Did I do something wrong? Is it all about that night in the lead mill? What's going on? God, what are you doing? You see, if we have a picture of God, a God who is in meticulous control of every tiny, minute detail in our lives, then it would be really, really easy to draw the conclusion that he's not very nice. And that's just a testimony of my little life. What about stuff that we've seen through the history of our planet, the Holocaust and other such horrendous happenings. If God is in meticulous control of every detail, that's a real struggle for me. But maybe, just maybe, that those witnesses in the Bible, maybe, maybe those that we know that have suffered and suffered all kinds of horrendous things and still come along and continue worshipping. Maybe, maybe there is something different about the world we live in and the God that we serve. You see, as I read the scripture, and I do from time to time, you'll be glad to know, then I think it's really clear to see that the Bible teaches that the state of the world is due to two things. One, humanity's rejection of God. We see it in the garden. We see it time and time and time again. That as God's creation, as his people have gone about their lives, they've turned from him and they've decided to go their own way. And so rather than the life full of love and joy and peace and patience, we see a life that is marred by bad choice after bad choice after bad choice. And if that's one thing that the Bible teaches us about the state of the world, the other is this, that God has an enemy. An enemy whose sole purpose is to rob and kill and to destroy and to tear down and to do all manner of things to break that relationship that Jesus won for us on the cross, to see us turn from him and to go our own way, to jack it in and to say enough is enough. So when we see others suffer, when we suffer ourselves, I think that there are two questions that we need to face. The first is this, whose way will we choose? Will we choose to continue to follow God or will we, or will we choose to go our own way? And the second question that we face is how in the face of life do we hold on to our faith James writes, and I've referenced it already, consider it pure joy, joy to the world. Well, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Firstly, testing of your faith. No, God is not testing us. James writes a little bit further down in verse 13 of chapter 1. When tempted, 
And another translation for tested is tempted. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. No, God is not testing us. And we will get to the considerate pure joy in just a moment. But what does it mean in the face of trial and suffering and all of that stuff? What does it mean to have faith? Faith is the name of my daughter. It causes all kinds of fun when you work in church. I've lost faith. Hmm. Have you? I've just seen her running through there. It's not existential angst. Um, thank you very much. Badum. The Greek word for faith, uh, which when you share with this as you're going through your talk with your daughter and you say, the Greek word for faith is pistis. And she goes... <laughs> Shows me that she's not as mature as she'd like us to think that she is. But the Greek word pistis means to believe. Yeah? It means to trust. It means to have confidence in. It means to have faith in. And the trouble is that we so often get caught up with faith at the point of just simply believing something. I believe that there's a God. I believe that he exists. Great. I believe that Jesus lived and he died. Brilliant. I believe in the cross. Great. He died and I'm forgiven of my sin. Brilliant. I believe all of that. Amazing. Wonderful. I have an intellectual assent to a piece of knowledge and a piece of information. And if that's all there is, then when we don't get our first choice lives, when lives don't go quite in the way that they should, then we're in a place where we begin to question whether or not that God exists because surely it shouldn't be like this. So we often get stuck as believers in the whole believer thing. I believe that God exists, but life tells me something different. What do I do with it? No, pistis means to believe, to trust, to have confidence in, to place our faith in. And so the question for us is not do we believe that God exists, But do we trust him? Because in that question, in the do you trust him question, then we can see what James writes about the testing of our faith, of being something that can build us up and not simply tear down the faith that we have. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning as we continue to trust our Father in heaven that he is good. And as C.S. Lewis wrote, is he safe? No. (laughs) But he is good. He is good. And if you need proof, it's there on the wall behind me. He sent his son to suffer at the hands of men so that we might be drawn into a loving relationship with him. And trusting God is powerful. And as we uh, stand here on the launch of the Nehemiah Fund, I was reminded of this in Hebrews 11, which says this, And what more shall we say? I do not have time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. You see, faith, a trust in God is powerful to change things. And Bayek, as we meet to launch a fund for, uh, for planting churches with not so many in church and not so many there this morning, then by it we're going to need faith. Do you trust him? Will you trust him? Even when life is not going your way. Consider it pure joy. I don't think I'm quite at that stage yet, James. But James is not saying grin and bear it. He's not saying put on a brave face, pretend everything's okay, that nothing's wrong, come and sing your joyful songs. James is not saying that, but he is inviting us to shift our perspective. 
he is calling us to take a stand against the enemy's schemes who all he wants to do is to shake the trust that you have in God because trusting God is powerful weeping may stay for the night the Bible is full of lament the Psalms are full of people going through tough experiences Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. See, Joseph chose to trust God. Mary chose to trust God. Not for their first choice lives. Not for their second, not for their third, not for their fifth, not for their 20th choice life. But for a life that they had never even dreamed. Was it hard? think so and just to end this isn't a time to compare suffering well you've only had your nose bitten off what about me it's not about comparing our suffering uh, but this year my second son turned 18 and uh, that marks pretty much to the day um, the death of my mum at the tender age of 59 from cancer and there was a song that was going around at the time, which I just want to share with you, because I think it, at the time, was, uh, was probably the first that I'd heard in quite a while of songs that really acknowledged that the Christian life wasn't just happy, happy, happy all the time. It's a Matt Redman song, and it says this, Blessed be your name, when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. But it goes on and says, blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Weeping may stay for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I'm going to invite the band to come up. Got a couple of songs to sing as we respond to this. What about you? All well and good. We need to trust him. We need to maybe change our perspective a little. Really interesting. But what's your personal response? What does this mean to you personally today? I don't know what's going on in your lives. I get a little glimpse and a snapshot of some. But what does this mean for you today? Are you going through the mill? Have you been beaten up? Have you been abused, slandered? accused have you lost your nose lost a parent lost a loved one been betrayed have you got your second choice life will you choose today to say blessed be your name Lord I trust you maybe you've been a Christian forever and you've believed in him for many years, but you've never put your trust in him. You're invited in all that he's done for you, in the love that he poured out on the cross. Will you trust the one that would lay down his very life for you? Maybe you've trusted him a little, and you know that you need to trust him that little bit more. You're invited today. Maybe you've had that diagnosis. Maybe you have lost that loved one. Maybe COVID has been cruel. Maybe the pandemic has left you in a state of fear and anxiety. Or maybe you've been living with anxiety for far too long. Will you trust him? Because you are invited. And so today... As we start the Advent season, don't worry, it will be more cheerful as we go towards Christmas. The invitation is to turn back to him, away from our own way of life, doing things and choosing what we want, pursuing with our own strength and energy and money and finances and all that we've got, pursuing our best life. Will you turn to him again? Will you put your hand in his and say, Lord, 
I'm your servant. I'm your child. Take me, take my life, and do with it whatever you have. Because what you have for me, Lord, is by far and away my best life. Let's stand together, shall we?